the past, work-related injuries and illnesses were simply considered part of the job. There were no protections in place to cover treatment costs associated with an illness or injury sustained on the job. Wage loss protection was unheard of, and workers injured on the job had no recourse other than to sue their employer for negligence. That rarely resulted in a positive outcome for the worker. Typically, the employer had assets to afford legal representation, and there were no laws that required anything of the employer if an employee suffered a workplace injury or illness. After this brief history, we explored definitions associated with disability and its different levels. For instance, if a worker is injured or becomes ill based on the job, workers' comp will pay 100% of the medical costs associated with the treatments for the medical condition. Wage loss is covered for two-thirds of the worker's pre-disability gross income. For workers who suffered permanent disabilities or who are killed on the job, workers' compensation laws have been extended to cover workers and their families through death benefits and other compensation. We also examined occupational versus non-occupational issues and saw that it's rare that a work comp policy will cover non-occupational losses. In that vein, we also discussed own and any occupation definitions. Workers' compensation contracts are neither in a strict sense, as they cover workplace accidents. But it's important to understand these because certain jobs and positions are exempt from coverage under a workers' comp policy. And if workplace coverage is desired for those positions, standard contracts must be endorsed with a voluntary employee endorsement. Another method of protecting exempt employees would be through an occupational disability income policy, which will cover a person on or off the job. An occupational disability policy will not, however, pay for the medical expenses incurred due to a loss. These costs would have to be covered by a health insurance policy if the worker has one. We explored the different classifications of disability, which range from minor temporary partial disabilities, like a broken finger, all the way through permanent total disability, in which the insured will never return to pre-disability condition. We continued with the concepts of compulsory and elective coverage states. All states except Texas require workers' comp insurance. The section finished by comparing competitive states to monopolistic states. Most states are competitive states, and in these jurisdictions, private carriers compete to secure workers' compensation insurance business. The monopolistic states offer workers' comp through a state-controlled mechanism only. Coverage from private carriers is simply not available. Competitive states also have a state fund option, available to employers as well as private carrier options. Self-insurance is another option for those employers that enjoy good cash flow and can afford to pay for losses out of pocket. These employers usually also purchase stop-loss coverage that limits their self-insurance costs after a certain point. Our next section looks at covered losses and what occurs if more than one insurance policy is in force that may cover a work-related loss. We'll look at exclusions and see that even though workers' comp is no-fault coverage, there are definitely situations in which an exclusion will apply and the loss will not be covered. An important topic we'll examine are the different parts to a workers' compensation policy. Work comp policies have six, and we'll study each of them. The two critical parts are parts one and two. These are the workers' compensation part and the employer liability part, respectively. Parts three through six deal with facets of the policy like work comp coverage for workers in other states, conditions following a loss, premiums, duties of the insured, and a concept referred to as premium audits. How premiums are determined is discussed in depth. There are multiple factors that go into calculating the correct premium for these policies. Job classifications are also important, as an incorrect classification of an employee can result in significant changes to the annual premium upon audit. As a producer, workers' compensation rating and premium classifications are two of the more important areas to consider when assisting a business in applying for workers' comp coverage. The last portion of this course explores methods by which premiums may be modified based on experience and other factors. This is much like how automobile insurance is based heavily on driving record, among other things. Workers' comp insurance has similar attributes. If an employer has a lot of workers' comp losses, their rates for coverage will increase. Workers' compensation uses what are called modification factors, or experience modifiers, that can reward a good risk with premium discounts. Conversely, experience modifiers are also used to increase premium rates if the employer is a poor risk. Then we'll examine payroll and its primary role in determining the proper premiums. Premiums for workers' compensation are based on a per $100 of payroll basis and the risk associated with a particular job classification. It's probably not a shock to you that a company is going to pay significantly more for a worker who handles explosives than one who works in an office, even when working for the same employer. 
Finally, we'll explore what's known as the Second Injury Fund. This provides incentives for employers who hire disabled workers by providing additional protections in the event of a second disabling injury or illness of the same type.